Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. Those on this podcast accept no liability for the outcomes of medical decisions based on this information. As the radiologists like to say, clinical correlation is required. This is not medical advice, and this does not constitute a physician-patient relationship. If you have a medical problem, seek medical attention. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. And now a word from this week's sponsor, Laurel Road. Since I had my son, paying down my med school debt has become my top priority. I remember holding him in my arms for the first time, looking into his beautiful little face, and just wanting the best future for him. With the Laurel Road Student Loan Cashback Card, my regular purchases earn me 2% cashback when I use it to pay down my student loans, which helps me reach my goals faster and plan for my family's future. Laurel Road for Doctors. Banking insights and benefits uniquely designed for doctors. See laurelroad.com slash doctor checking for full terms and conditions. Laurel Road is a brand of KeyBank NA member FDIC. Dr. Gopi Shah, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Brad. I'm super excited to be here. It's nice to talk to you again. You too, you too. So yeah, I was a guest a little while ago on the Backtable ENT podcast, of which you are one of the hosts. So uh, first, just give us a, a little brief summary of what is the Backtable ENT podcast. Yeah, so um, Backtable is a podcasting podcast. Uh, company. It's kind of, I guess, medical media. Um, It started with interventional radiology. Um, This is my husband's baby. Um, It started with interventional radiology about five years ago. Um, And within the last year and a half to two years, we started an ENT podcast with it. And the goal is just conversations with peers, peer to peer conversations, whether it's clinical topics, professional topics, uh, work life topics, um, just so that it's a way to have those conversations that you go when you go to the meeting, and you see that colleague, that resident, that, you know, whoever you trained with, whatever friend, whatever colleague, and you're like, what do you really do about this? Or, hey, I saw a patient and this is, you know, what I saw. And it's not necessarily what the lecture, the panel was about, or maybe it is, but you you kind of just get inside somebody's head a little bit just to get their perspective on whatever it is. And so that's the goal of it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And uh, it's where I get a lot of my continuing medical education. Too. <laughs> Well, I love your podcast because I, I think that it also is helpful for just overall when you're practicing too on how to talk to patients, how to run your clinic. Um, and I think I told you this uh, the last time we talked, uh, one of my favorite ones was the EMR one, the EMR specialist, um, I think from Australia. Um, and just because for me, the EMR and pace and getting patients in and out and documenting, making sure that that's something that I still struggle with even yeah. almost 10 years later. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Yeah. I, as much as I was a believer in what, uh, and actually I had two podcasts in a row that did a similar topic just, and the, 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 the idea was just for those who, who haven't listened to those episodes, just finish your charts. You're done with the patient, finish your chart, just, just finish it. Even though there are people in the waiting room, even though you got, cause if you finish your chart, you're going to finish it like what, 30 seconds or a minute. Yeah. But if you save it for the end of the day, you're going to screw around. You're going to yep. forget some things you're going to, it's going to take you. And then you've got an infinite amount of time to finish it. Whereas if you're pressed to fit, just going to finish it, you can do it fast. Yeah. So the 30 second signed closed encounter will turn into a five minute. And if you have 10, it's going to be an extra hour later as opposed yep. to potentially yep. 20 minutes behind in clinic. Or exactly. Something. Exactly. So, yeah. okay. So, um, so one of the reasons we have specialists and sub sub specialists like you on the podcast is just to teach us everything that if you were giving a lecture to a, a bunch of medical students that they, you would want every physician to know. Uh, so as a pediatric otolaryngologist, I think like sick kids, with snotty, runny noses. Now yes. I'm, I'm a general p- otolaryngologist, so I see that as well. Yeah. Um, so if like a pathologist <laughs> were to come up to you and say, hey, I think my kid might have X, Y, Z, like what are, what are some issues that you'd want all physicians to be aware of? Um, so I think the one thing, and again, whether you're pediatric ENT or general otolaryngologist that you'll see in kids, 
the the three big ones i think um one is going to be you know when is an ear tube indicated um in a kid the second big one is going to be snoring and sleep disordered breathing in a child and the third big one i think is going to be that noisy breathing in the infant um and so those are to me are the big three of what probably whether you're a general otolaryngologist seeing kids or if you're in a super specialized academic otolaryngology practice at least 50 if not 70 percent of the clinic patients that you see are going to be for those three things if they're kids and so in turn yeah so those are the big so what are the yeah so what are the what are the red flags right like what are the what are yes. the things we're looking for so I think in kids, when I think of tubes, uh, you know, one is, of course, you know, the recurrent ear infection kid, and then the other one is going to be the ear fluid and concern for speech delay kid. Um, and they're going to be your younger kids under four is kind of when I think of that group for the most part. Um, I think the one thing to remember for the, re, uh, the recurrent ear infection kid is, you know, I, we had those new <laughs> and i know they're just clinical practice guidelines but we had those and actually there's another updated one but in 2011 was the big one where yes it's the number of ear infections so the three and six months or four year but i think that seeing fluid on the day of the ent visit is very important um because i think that allows you to kind of have one other piece of objective data with on your exam to help you decide yes or no because what I, uh, and a lot of those families it's going to be a, it's going to be thank you, we didn't want surgery, or no, you don't understand, we're always in the pediatrician's office. Like you're getting it on the tail end that we just finished the stuff in your 10 days, ago, like, you know, the 10 day course two days ago. But, um, and I always tell those families, you know, so the child that has the history, but no fluid, um, to let's see each other at least in three months, but call me. The next time you get diagnosed, call me, let's take a look. I'll get you in within, you know, that week or, you know, three to four days. Let's take a look and rediscuss. So I, I do think that seeing that fluid on the day of the visit is important for recurrent ear infections. In terms of uh, ear fluid, so the kid that um, just has fluid, not pus, and the question is, is it going away or not? And how is it affecting their speech? And so I always tell families, listen, you know, if the ear fluid started, we can say, okay, it started at the time of this infection, 90% of kids will clear within three months. And if the fluid is picked up on routine screening, so they failed the hear hearing test at school or they went to the pediatrician's office and they had fluid, 50 to 60% will clear in three months. And so that three months is kind of that magic time number, unless we're really concerned about speech delay or like, you know, hey, I've noticed my child has, you know, has been saying, huh, what, for three, four months you know, or, hey, yeah, well, I'm worried that he's behind in school a little bit, like, or he's getting, in tr or she's getting in trouble. Um, and then we have a field hearing test and that there's fluid and it looks like there's, you know, that sort of uh, serious stuff that looks like it's old and just been sitting there. You may, you don't always have to wait the three months, you could potentially offer the tubes or do a closer follow up. Um, and so that's quite, kind of my spiel on tubes. Now there is, in terms of pediatric otolaryngology and some of the, you know, I think whether you're pediatric or general, you know, we all see children with Down syndrome as well. That's gonna be a big part of our pediatric practice. And I think that, you know, in terms of children with Down syndrome, 50 to 80% are gonna get at least one set of ear tubes. And the question is who and when? So what's hard I, to me, <laughs> Um, I don't know. I don't know about you, Brad, but I've, I have had a, you know, some a handful of down uh, children with Down syndrome when we're trying to get tubes and they brought me to my knees, right? The yep. canal is small. There's that yep. anterior overhang. There can mm -hmm. be a weird angle. You can't see. You can barely get a 3-0 speculum in. Yeah, you, you might can't have get that. the tube. The speculum yeah. is so small <laughs> that you can't get the tube through it. Exactly. So you stick the tube in the ear canal and then the speculum. And then you have and your then you rosin. Gotta somehow manipulate you it yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah. <laughs> And it so, is a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. Sometimes you can't even get it in. Absolutely. Sometimes you can't even get it in. It's absolutely it's, yes. Yeah, and it so for challenge. it can be. And so for those kids, you know, um, and also you know there there's a complex. So not just difficult anatomy, uh, but a lot of you know there's a big spectrum in terms of cardiac conditions and how sick a child with Down syndrome may be in terms of anesthesia risk, as well as you know. I, you know, they have fluid on their, uh, I don't know, six month hearing screen. Um, I'm not gonna just go ahead and let's plan for tubes. I'm gonna wait it out a little bit, give them some time to see, you know, 
for the the young ones, I try to wait a little bit longer. Yeah, a little growth and development might yes, uh, might help it to resolve. Might, exactly, it's, it's, it's the end of this winter. Cold and flu season's going Absolutely. away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's kind of my my spiel, I guess, overall in terms of tubes and fluid. Well, something I would I would add to that would be one. It's important to recognize that the ear exam is hard. It mm -hmm. is hard. It like, is hard. We've looked at thousands of years. But one thing that that Gopi and I have a, an advantage is even after we were done with our training, we have audiologists at our disposal, we have tympanograms at our disposal. Yes. So if we're not sure, is that fluid? Is it not? I'm continuing to learn what fluid looks like in all different sorts of looking ears. Why? Because I have something that double checks my work. 100%. So I have something that, and plus I have the advantage of looking at adult ears as well. So I see these big giant ears that, <laughs> um, that that are much easier to look at than a wiggly screaming two-year-old right you, you have that kid that comes in with a snotty runny nose mm -hmm. and there it's a struggle to restrain them to even get an ear exam and so you look at the ear and the ear is bright red yeah. but then you got a normal tympanogram and the ears bright red because there's like it's just hypervascular because the they're kid's crying down. and they're yes. crying yes right yes so yes. i would implore all of my pediatric colleagues, my um, emergency medicine colleagues, my urgent care colleagues to buy a tympanogram. 100%. Buy 100%. One. Because one, you'll you'll be able to double check your work. And two, you'll be less likely to miss something because there, there are these kids walking around with fluid in their ears. It's pretty translucent fluid, so it's hard to see. It's hard to see. And so this is gonna be how you can differentiate that red eardrum is just from bearing down in a kid who's febrile and screaming and waking up in the middle of the night, tugging at their ears. Why? Self-soothing behavior. So yeah. this can be, you know, really confusing and, and just hard to hard to diagnose. And so that's well, sometimes the, the patients that end up in, in our office too, which is why those guidelines say abnormal ear exam, because it's just, it's hard. It's hard yeah. to diagnose. Um, I think uh, the otoscopic exam is very difficult. And um, I think for me, I still have times where I'll look at the tympanogram and do my exam and I'm like, oh, okay. You know, it may be yeah. a little different. I use the tympanogram uh, to really supplement and help me think about what I'm seeing as well as parents like objective data. And so if you can discuss with them that the eardrum can move, if there is pressure when you're taking away pressure and, you know, that their ability to clear that pressure and equalize, um, that's a good thing. And so- yeah. How much fluid? uh 0.3 i'm not sure what they're really asking when when i think they're looking for more like a lot or a little yeah, but if you have a tympanogram right. yeah you can be like There's oh it's negative there. 300 mm -hmm. and normal is you know 100 negative yeah. 100 and and, and the uh, only thing i would say the only thing i would say about the tympanogram is remember so it's the probe to the eardrum. So if there's a bunch of cerumen impaction, if the canal is small and angled or the canal is floppy, right? Which you can have, especially in younger kids, craniofacial kids um, and our, our kids with Down syndrome, um, just, you know, every once in a while you'll get a flat temp and maybe not have fluid. And, you know, if, if we're not sure, um, that's where I do think it's okay to papoose and take a look with a microscope. Um, if you're trying to figure out surgery, no surgery, what what's exactly going on or you know let him try to do cerumen removal versus hey let's do a little debrox or peroxide go home come back in a week those those things are all okay yeah yeah um any other advice for being able to accurately diagnose an ear infection gosh it's so hard right um so i think the big difference between is it just like a mucoid fluid like snot versus pus right is the eardrum just oh, kind of that's tough because mucoid fluid <laughs> is is white is white right and pus is yellow and there's yes. a marginal difference between yeah. white and yellow yeah so yeah. Um, and then but i i, I think that uh, there there's maybe a little bit more angry inflammation redness to the eardrum sometimes vascularity um bulging i think those things uh make a difference i've never really gotten into the whole light reflex thing and not no. thing i don't really know what yeah. that is but uh, i was learned i was I taught that in medical school <laughs> and and i and i hear that in some of my trainees they're yeah. like well it's missing a light reflex I'm like, that's an excellent yeah. point but that's an unreliable indicator. Don't yeah. stop, stop telling so me about the I don't know about, yeah. I, what do you think about this, Brad? Um, so the one thing that sometimes I'll do um, in my kids that are a little bit older, um, maybe like as young as six, seven, 
Um, and it's going to be the kids where the parents are really not wanting an ear tube. They've already had two or three sets, but maybe there's some persistent eustachian tube dysfunction, maybe near normal audiometry and speech is okay. Um, I'll sometimes use otoendoscopy, like I'll put a camera in. Um, and so that way we can all look, whether it's a flex or a rigid. Um, and that way, because I think the parents like seeing the eardrum. Now, it's very helpful uh, if when there's a perf for sure, because they can see how big it is and what we're looking at. And, you know, because they come in and we're just taking a look, whether it's an otoscope or a microscopic exam, I, I think for parents, it's nice to, again, see what you're seeing and why you're like telling them to come back in six months or saying, let's do tubes or, hey, let, we're going to watch this one area here. And this is why I want us to do close follow up. So that is one thing I started to do a little bit more frequently, not all the time, not every You could use your laryngoscope. Uh, you could use your flexible exact, laryngoscope act, to exactly. stick that in the ear. You don't need yep. a, a separate setup. I mean, this is need- now we're talking just to the otolaryngologist. Sorry, yeah. everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> But so. but for everyone else, I think the uh, the tuning fork test can actually be do do. A, I don't really know how useful Rene is. Um, I'm not sure about your experience, but a Weber. That's where you put it on the middle of their forehead or mm-hmm. on their maxillary teeth to mm-hmm. make sure it's clean. And you put it on the maxillary teeth, it actually makes it more sensitive. And if it's louder on one side, now again, this is for the older kids or for the right. adults. Um, but this is a pediatric ENT lecture, so it's really for the older kids. <laughs> you're not sure what you're looking at. You know, a Weber can really be uh, helpful. Because yeah. the lower frequencies, especially, are going to be more sensitive for uh, conducting so, hearing loss. So let me ask you, um, for the ear fluid patient, uh, do you do Flonase and allergy medicine, or do you not do Flonase and allergy medicine? Do you give them anything? What what's your what what do you like to do? How do you manage that? Or so is it just like, hey, ca- we're what, just going to watch? If I'm if remembering the Academy guidelines, the answer is nothing. Right? Nothing. But what do you Nothing do in your practice? Fluid. So what do I do in my practice? So it depends. I, I want to see if there's an underlying condition. Um, so I'll do a nasal endoscopy. Um, and but for the for the um, you know non otolaryngologists out there, I would say manage this symptomatically. Do they have a nasal obstruction? And if they have a nasal obstruction, then you can put them on a nasal steroid because then you're actually treating something. If there's no nasal obstruction, they just had a cold and now the cold is gone. I would say nothing. Now I also have colleagues that use steroids. They'll put them on steroids, but I don't, uh, I will do nothing unless there's an underlying condition like a sinus infection or enlarged adenoids. Cause then I'm treating something as opposed yeah. to just giving Flonase, but I have, I have colleagues that will, will give nasal steroids. Yeah, I think I agree. I agree with you. Um, I think unless they're, you know, if they have allergic rhinitis, if they're, like you said, nasal congestion, nasal obstruction, something up here in the nose, um, then I do, I, I don't, I think a nasal steroid spray can be helpful, at least at minimum for those symptoms. And I always tell the family this may or may not change anything for the fluid. Um, if there's a lot of clear rhinorrhea or sneezing, those kinds of other more systemic allergy symptoms, I might do a little Zyrtec. If they're totally fine, and I totally agree with you, if they had the cold, it's gone, and there's a little fluid left, do nothing. And, you know, I, I think that some families want something, but many families nowadays are happy with, let's watch. Yeah, I don't want to yeah. keep doing antibiotics. Here's a plan. I don't you keep... need a definitive plan. And there, yeah. that's that's good. We're good as long yeah. as there's a plan. Yeah. 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 But except for those parents that are like, we're in the pediatricians all the time getting antibiotics. And then that's why you might not wait, right? And, and, yeah. you, might, and you might do tubes. Um, yeah. So another question is for those kids, like we're, we're just making it to the end of the winter. Kids are back in daycare. Yeah. Masks are off. Not like it prevented my kids from getting sick. Yeah. Actually, it's a good question for me. I got a house full of uh, snotty yeah. noses right now. Um, how do you differentiate a cold from a sinus infection, right? You've got the kids now without sticking a camera up a nose, right? We have yeah. the advantage that we can do a nasal endoscopy. We can see, but... Um, you know, what would be your, your advice be for pediatricians, urgent care, family medicine, where um, you've got these daycare kids, they've got, yeah. you know, a four-year-old has a snotty nose all winter. How do yeah. you differentiate cold after cold after cold from a sinus infection that would benefit from antibiotics? Yeah, no, I think that's really hard. A, a viral URI uh, to acute sinusitis, bacterial to whether it's actual chronic. Um, because I, you know, we know that kids, especially under the age of three, get six to eight URIs a year. And so, like you said, they had, there was RSV in the class and there was rhino and then they, somebody had adeno, somebody then had flu. And so how do you, 
how do you know? Um, and I think, you know, some of the questions are, do they get better in between? Um, does it clear up? Um, and sometimes they'll just say, you know, or if the nose is still running, but they're not fevering, they're eating and they're playing. Okay, that's a good thing. Um, is it, uh, did they, you know, is it uh, that it got a little bit better? Now it's worse with fevers and more purulent rhinorrhea um, and they just don't look good, don't feel good. And now it's been three to seven, eight days or in an older kid, I might even give in more like that seven to 10, then it may be a little bit more of like an acute bacterial. I think the one thing, you know, to in terms of red flags, and these aren't as common, but I think in an outpatient setting, I think that our colleagues see this more is going to be, you know, that uh, mild preceptal cellulitis uh, of the orbit of the upper lid, you know, or lower lid that can sometimes happen with acute sinusitis, even as young as one I've seen. And those are some of the red flags where if they have the, you know, uh, URI symptoms, fever, and now the upper lid is red and swollen. And I think if, um, you know, it is okay to do oral antibiotics for that with very strict ER warnings, because those eyes can blow up overnight, get yeah. a lot bigger, a lot harder, a lot swollen, it can turn into something scary like a, a superior orbital abscess or something you know further in terms of that kind of complication. Oh yeah, in my experience, those happen quickly. Like it's mm -hmm. not like, well, they got a cold and then the cold got a little better and then they got yeah. a fever. It was more like they had a snotty nose for a day and then just boom, the eye just yeah. shut. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 just, you know, it's not the chronic sinusitis that causes these complica complications. No. It's acute sinusitis, and nobody that's in someone that's never had sinusitis before, it can be uh, absolutely can be really scary. This is your yeah. Now, in terms of chronic sinusitis in a kid, right? That's I think the million dollar diagnostic question. Still, like we have these consensus statements, we have these, and I, you know, my little niche is like pediatric sinus, right? But I think that heart, uh, you know, runny nose sinus kid under the age of seven is actually really hard to tease apart. And I think that, um, you know, I think that sort of more than three months of significant nasal obstruction, mouth breathing, and uh, whether it's either chronic cough can present this way or um, thick runny nose that just doesn't get better, maybe where you have to think, okay, is this chronic adenoiditis? You know, because some people don't believe that chronic, you know, is it chronic sinusitis? What's the difference between adenoiditis and chronic sinusitis? I mean, without a um, camera up the nose, you can't, you can't tell yeah. the difference. The one thing on your anterior rhinoscopy, and this will happen probably about once every six months, I'll get a, a patient for chronic sinusitis in a, like a three-year-old and it's a nasal form body. So that's yeah. something that, um, you know, that's the one thing that the, I'm like, yes, this is the source. Let's get it out and <laughs> yeah. your life will get better. I promise this is the Those best thing in the whole world. Those are some of my favorite cases, yeah. Yeah, oh, right? It's so cathartic, and except it stinks. It like as soon so as you take it out oh, of the a, nose, the whole yes. room smells. It's like, like a dead skunk. Look? It's an yeah. animal. <laughs> And, and usually a lot of times, like you said, you can walk into the room and it smells like, you know, yeah. so bad. But um, so that's one thing. And a lot of times, you know, it's and, and the child may or may not have unilateral rhinorrhea. Usually it will be unilateral rhinorrhea that's persistent. When you look in the nose, sometimes you'll see it. But every once in a while, it'll get missed because there's a bunch of snot sitting in front of whatever it is. And, you know, sometimes it can be uh, missed as well. So especially because it's not like the kid's going to tell you they put the sponge piece or whatever. <laughs> it's always a sponge, <laughs> right? Like it's it a is. bit of couch cushion. It's something so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> so, I guess a bead um, or something will be easier to see. But the, uh, yeah. the couch cushion absorbs all that mucus. Yeah. And so let's say now it's like the three to seven year age group that, you know, they've been on six courses of antibiotics in the year for sinus infections are all 10 day courses and it's, they get better while they're on it, but literally a week later, the stuff comes back and it, they just, it's congestion and usually it's either thick rhinorrhea or cough or something. Um, if I can scope them, I will try to do that because I, I want to make sure I don't see polyps. I want to see what the adenoids look like. Um, I want to see, is there pus? Is it just clear stuff? How pale is the mucosa? Is this more allergies? Um, and you know, that depending on what that looks like, if it's like, Hey, those adenoids are big and they're red and beefy, or there's a bunch of drainage on it. I'm going to go for that first. And, um, that's usually what it is. Now, I think the workup in a kid is very important. Um, I do think, um, you know, if you're really thinking chronic sinusitis, I think uh, a sweat test to make sure we don't have cystic fibrosis. Um, if once that's ruled out, um, 
the other thing that they're starting to do um, is a nitric oxide test, the nasal nitric oxide. Uh, once CF is ruled out, if that is low, that might be a concern for primary ciliary dyskinesia. Right when I was when I was training, and right when I I was like the go-to person in my office for ciliary biopsy. Yeah. Because we would send Where them to Mount them Sinai. From? We'd get glutaraldehyde from Mount Sinai, which is not that far from us. I would take a dental, this thing that like is meant to clean between your teeth. I'd use that Little to abrade mucosa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try to get it from the middle middle meatus. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't do it under endoscopy because you can't hold them. You still can't for hold that. and but do no, it. but you can aim for the middle meatus. Yes, and I, and yes. I got good good tissue. Yeah. But they don't do that anymore. It's now. Yeah genetic testing they'll do genetic yeah, testing or what do. was the other that you said uh so the nasal nitric oxide so okay. in a non-infected nose we should have a decent level of nitric oxide in our nose um it can be lower in cf as well as pcd so usually um once the sweat tech test is cleared or negative then i will um we can do that but they usually i think it's five and up at least here at our at, at our center um and so that's something else. And again, that those kids are going to have that chronic odorrhea. This is their fifth set of tubes and their snot always coming out of their ears. Um, but those those workups are very important because especially with PCD, I think CF we're diagnosing earlier and earlier. But PCD is still something I feel like can be a late diagnosis between the ages of two and six. And those kids struggle for a long time until that diagnosis is there. In terms of genetic testing, I believe, so 10 years ago, I think there's maybe like not even 12 genes. Now I've heard that there's anywhere between 30 to 50 that they can test for. So it's it's become a lot more. And usually I, we, we have uh, pulmonary co pulmonology colleagues that, you know, if we're really thinking that workup, that's who I send them to for the nitric oxide screen. And then they can help me decide if they want further genetic testing. And if the sweat is elevated, I'll reach out to them and then they can decide about uh, the genetic testing for cystic fibrosis. Other things I'll, I'll ask is, you know, immunization status, whether it's up to date or not, um, and if they've had any other infections anywhere else. Um, and then, you know, in terms of allergy immunology, I have kids <laughs> getting a, a, a blood draw in a five-year-old is a big to-do. So I don't just start ordering a bunch of labs. I actually will send them to my pediatric allergy immunology colleagues for chronic sinusitis or whatnot, and then they can decide if they want to do a RAST and, and what kind of um, immunology panel they want to get. Yes, you can get basic immunoglobulins and, you know, titers for uh, H. flu and pneumococcal. Um, and a lot of times, sometimes they might just need a little bit of a booster. But as opposed to me sticking that and then being like, oh, everything looks normal. I'm going to still send you over there. You know what I mean? Because I don't feel comfortable to say, yeah, we're, you're good. Um, so I'll, I'll tend to send those out um, just because they also that's what they do. They're a lot smarter than me when it comes to thinking about the entire picture from the allergy immunology standpoint. This um, is their wheelhouse. This is their that's wheelhouse. Their wheelhouse. Right? Yeah. And then, yeah, and then I, that, that's kind of my initial workup, at least. I talk to families about sinus rinses, and so I, I have to show them pictures. So obviously, to me, the youngest, so one of my CF patients uh, showed me, have you heard of the Sinu Gator, Brad? It's like Sinu. alligator gator. No. So it's S-I-N-U, but gator. And um, you prepare the bottle the same way as you would a regular with distilled water, bottled water, and then you add the packet of salt. And then it has a top that you twist on. The top has a little applicator to the nose and you push a button and it shoots it up. And it kind of is like more of like a power washer, if you will, like a high intensity saline mist almost. Oh yeah, um, yeah, no, I, I know, I know what you're, I just pictured an alligator, but um, yeah. <laughs> like it's no, like ir sinus irrigator, sinugator, not mm -hmm. uh, sinu alligator. Uh, yeah, yeah, like our chronic sinusitis patients will, yes. will use that. They'll use that to power yes. wash their sinuses. Yeah. Or that's where we'll put their budesonide or topical mm -hmm. antibiotics. Yeah, yeah, our adult patients use that. Definitely. Yeah, and so I think kids as young as four can do that. Wow. Um, yeah, one of, it was a four-year-old patient with cystic fibrosis that introduced me to that. Mm. Um, in terms of younger patients, I've had uh, a handful of families use what's called the nasal line which is basically saline that you have a syringe for. The syringe mm -hmm. has like, you know, that uh, nasal, like what they do nasal versed with, with the nasal applicator, the tip. Mm -hmm. And literally on like an 18 month old, they'll just hold their child forward and kind of squirt it up. Um, to, and and they'll, they'll get big, thick slugs of snot out. And that's been helpful. 
Um, some families um, will just use a little blue bulb syringe and just gently, um, but, and I understand that not everybody can just jump to those rinses. Like I have kids too. And so I get it. Um, and it may be that we just, we, the big thing is to not make the child scared of anything close to their nose. We want the child to be comfortable with things close to their nose, whether it's my otoscope, whether it's the Flonase to just the A average COVID test. Saline. Yes. <laughs> like my five-year-old yeah. is now like, anytime he gets a runny nose, he's like, am I going to get a swab? Am I going to get oh. a swab? He's, yeah. He's terrified. Yeah. So yeah, that, that has not helped our case. Yeah, it not hasn't. Our case. But what I tell them to do is get like, um, start with saline mist. I think that's maybe the easier one. And I'm like, yeah. just week one, let them play with it. Spray it on it's their like arm. It's like a humidifier. Like it's exactly. barely putting anything Spray up Spray it there. on yeah. their face so they're not scared of it. And then week two, after you've done it and the bottle's a fun thing, then start to help them see what it feels like to get in their nose. And I always tell families the consistency is key. Like I'm going to say, do it twice a day for the, you know, uh, until I see you in three months. But I always tell the, you know, especially my kids that are older, I'll say, you know, do it Monday to Thursday, right. You know, before bed, take the weekends off. If you do that for four to six weeks, it's better than doing it twice a day, uh, for, uh, four days and stopping. Yeah. Also, if your kids will cry and get upset and then win because you're like, ah, enough, fine, fine. Yeah. You know, that just reinforces that they can win. Yeah. And so now it's going to be so much. It's like people at a slot machine, right? Like yeah. they're going to keep on, if you, oh, they have to win every so often, not usually, yeah. they'll usually lose, but if they win every so often, they're going to stay at that slot machine. And the same thing with your kids, <laughs> right? Like true. if they win every so often, oh man, it's going to make it that much yeah. harder for, for, <laughs> for a long time. So speaking of, speaking of that, um, how does a pediatric otolaryngologist treat her sick kids? Like what are the oh, medicines yeah. that you have in your medicine cabinet? And we'll see if it's the same as mine. Okay. Well, so my kids are eight and 10. Um, so they're a little bit older. Um, I have uh, the cans of the saline mist. Um, and so if it's allergies or more like cold, if they have like a runny nose, I'll at least get them started on that. My older one, um, will do a sinus rinse, but who it's, it's a to do, like it takes time because the adult bottle is eight ounces. The pediatric one is four. Um, he can get through probably two to three ounces and then we're done, which is fine. At least something came out. Um, so those are the big things. My older one is dealing with some spring winter into spring allergies or something. I feel, I'm like, I need you to come scope and brag. Cause I'm like, what's <laughs> happening back there? You're like mouth breathing. And I'm like, Oh God, I should know. Our but... trees aren't putting out any in New York. Our trees aren't putting out any pollen yet. Like there's, <laughs> oh. there's, there's nothing right now. So. We're about to get caked with pollen. Texas, April mm. is just a yellow sheet of stuff on your cars. But, um, so we might, I might have uh, a Flonase, um, and then I'll have a several cans of the mist. Cause I, if we've used them, it's been more than like a month or six, I'll just throw it away and, and have them start a new one. Um, and that's pretty much it. I'll ha I have some Zyrtec um, available, but I don't always uh, use it. My kids don't like taking the medicines and they're not you, that sneezy. Um, like it's not that big of an issue. Um, and then I have a bottle of Afrin on hand in case they get a nosebleed um or some bleed but i you know fortunately knock on wood they're a little bit older now we used to deal with that a little bit more between two and six you know that yeah picking mm -hmm. that nose and rubbing yep. it achieving that dry nose um and i think that may be what we have i might have a little like antibiotic ointment or aquaphor for their nose when it gets dry because they get a nosebleed maybe once or twice a year now what else am i missing yeah, my really haven't had nose bleeds, although last time i looked i turned around and one of them had both fingers up his nose <laughs> and then his brothers i turned around are imitating him oh, so gosh. all six fingers six fingers <laughs> up six nostrils yeah it's it's good sorry it's good you see so you said dermabond yes um i try to keep dermabond in the house that has saved us uh probably two or three er visits at this point mm. yeah so I try to get those when i can put them in my pocket <laughs> yeah, I'm not so huge on the saline with my kids. I mean, when they've got super snotty noses, I'll I'll use the saline. Uh, my oldest is amazing at blowing his nose. The other two aren't. That's so my great. kids, two, four, and five. He's, he's almost six, the oldest. Um, but um, and he's got asthma, so we've got the flow vent and the albuterol. So when the coughs come, um, you yeah. know, we, I I scale that up actually. So normally yeah. he's on one puff twice a day of flow vent, but when he's sick, I go to two or maybe even three. Now this is not medical advice because it's not FDA approved for that 
for that much. <laughs> but like when, you know, to keep him off the prednisone when he's acutely yeah. ill, you know, I'll be, I'll be scaling up on that. Um, and, and the albuterol as well. But, but the medicines for all of them, you know, Motrin and Tylenol, Motrin, I rely on a lot more heavily than Tylenol. If there's any pain or fever, just lasts longer. Um, then yeah. you're not waking up, you're less likely to be waking up in the middle of the night. But Benadryl, I rely very heavily on Benadryl, mm. not for its anticholinergic effects, not to dry up a, their, their snotty noses, but just to help them sleep through the night. Yeah. Like, cause when, when they're sick, they wake up so many times. Yeah. And I think there is, maybe I'm just rationalizing the therapeutic benefits of a good night's <laughs> sleep, uh, because I want a good night's sleep too. Yes. But I think, I think it's both right. Cause then the next day they're not zonked since they yeah. were up all night. Um, they're not, you, you know, what's worse than being sick, being sick and tired. So right. I use, I use Benadryl on mine, uh, which is FDA approved for two and over if I'm remembering that correctly, although I think the bottle says, you know, ask your doctor if they're less than four. Mm. Um, and then pseudoephedrine. Yeah. Good, it's good our, old pseudoephedrine. It's our friend. Like, it's our so friend. I don't send them to, so if they got a snotty nose and it's not COVID and I'm yeah. sending them to school, um, I'll give them a dose of pseudoephed so they're not blowing their nose and quite as snotty and drippy. And, and they can breathe. You know, exactly. And they can breathe better. So mm -hmm. that's FDA approved for two and over. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I can use that on, on, on all my boys now and Afrin too, but Afrin's FDA approved for six and over. So I can't, I can't use that on them just yet. Yeah. Um, but that's another thing. Yeah. When they're, when limited. they're so snotty. Yeah. Right. There's a rebound limited. effect of the oxym exactly. So you don't want to use it for more than a few <laughs> doses. Um, and you know, I've, I, yeah. How many patients have, oh, well, actually no, you're pediatric. So you haven't seen the people that have rhinitis medicamentosa. I from, have some, uh, oh. 10, uh, 10, 12, 13. I mean, people oh, really? will use stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because they just want their kid to breathe and not realizing that, Hey, there's an addictive, uh, aspect to it. So. Yeah. Or if you've got a kid who is flying, mm -hmm. you know, you're going on an airplane, squirt them with Afrin. Yes, and they're less likely to have any problems yeah. popping their ears yourself as well yeah. if you're uh, if you're gotten stuff you know so that's I tell you know that's what I have for my kids in the house. Yeah, I tell families um, when they're boarding do the Afrin, and then when the captain's saying we're about to land, do yep. the Afrin because the descent is also something. Obviously, um, this is going to be maybe that five six and up, um, younger kids, the infants. Take your passy, your bottle uh, for takeoff and landing. Landing's going to be harder. Uh, is that right in the air? Yeah, landing. Landing's going to be yep, harder because yep, yep, the um, pressure is increasing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and then between like two and four, um, have them see if you can make them drink something, suck on something. That's yep, a little bit of a, yep. you know, chew if they can chew sugar free gum or something. But that, again, that age, we don't want them to choke on that either. So, yeah, snacks and yeah. bottles and lollipops and yeah. 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 Yep, so tell me what your worse. thoughts are, because I know I'm sure you um, get a lot of kids as well for uh, the child with recurrent croup, otherwise healthy. They've had four episodes of croup uh, in the last, you know, January to April, and they're like three. What do you do with those kids? Otherwise healthy, no past his intubation history, you know. Do you take looks or do you tell, how do you counsel the family? What are your thoughts? So on I don't really do pediatric airway. I don't do pediatric airway. So, you know, I'll diagnose laryngomalacia and those noisy yeah. breathing, you know, four month olds and tell them, you know, we'll watch them for a while. But, um, you know, I don't do direct laryngoscopies. So I'll yeah. be referring that to my pediatric otolaryngo otolaryngology colleagues. However, my experience has been most of that is asthma masquerading as croup, where they'll get the croupy cough. Yeah. Croupy cough, worse at night, and it responds to albuterol. Yeah. You know, like if they haven't tried albuterol, like, cause typically the history is they, they're, they're, they're having trouble breathing. They might even be stridulous. Right. Yeah. And they get prednisone and they get better. Well, you know, the strider really isn't a hallmark of asthma, right. but I've seen plenty of kids with that croupy cough that respond to prednisone, but they've never actually tried albuterol. So they try albuterol and suddenly. Yeah. Get significantly better. So that's the first thing I'll do is I'll, I'll try them on albuterol while it's happening um, yeah. and see if they I respond. think that's a great point. Um, I think that's an excellent point because, you know, 
it, it's hard for me. It's hard to know, uh, are we going to do a DLB, like take a look, direct laryngoscopy, bronchoscopy and why, right? So if there's, you know, no intubation history, um, like in the, when they were born or ever had surgeries, things like that, um, it, you know, croup happens and it happens between, you know, as young as one, two to, you know, four, five, six, and uh, it tends to run its course eventually. And so a lot of times it's diagnostic, like your airway looks normal, but the virus likes to go right below the vocal cords, you know, but like you said, it might actually not even be that. Um, it might be some, you know, asthma or some reactive airway um, overall, as opposed to croup. And so um, in terms of when to take a look for me, I think it just depends on, you know, are you in and out of the ED all the time? Um, you know, how bad is it getting? You know, are we worried about DSATs? Um, you know, uh, is it more than just having to go to the PCP's office and getting an oral steroids? And then how worried are you? How comfortable are you? And is the child when these episodes happen? And if it's pretty like in extremis and there are more other, you know, there's something weird about it or something that's like a red flag, like, you know, constantly in the ED or just something, you know, then I'll take a look. But majority of the time, it's usually normal diagnostic. And sometimes that information is helpful because you just have to work. We have to work yep. through it. Then you can, then you can relax. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's your, as a physician, what's your sphincter tone? Like, are you going to be able to, my, yeah. my rule is if I'm going to lose sleep over this, I've done something wrong. Like yes, if absolutely. I'm worried about this kid, then I mean, yeah. <laughs> no, granted, there are plenty of yeah. patients out there that we, that we just yes. worry about. Right. But like, did I worry that I may have mismanaged this, right? If I'm worried yes. enough about this kid, they're like, oh man, they might have been ED. This might actually be something. Then that's when you, yeah, that's when you yeah. take a look. Absolutely. With the caveat that I'm not the one taking the right. look, I'm referring well, to you. Well, and you know, differential in that age group can be things like airway form bodies, right? That, uh, you know, maybe there was some history of choking, like, you know, a couple of weeks ago and, you know, they have intermittent strider, things like that. Um, you know, that, that's the other big one that we don't want to miss because you could end up with a bad pneumonia and intubated. I've seen that. Um, thought to be asthma, intubated, had a popcorn kernel, had a choking oh. event on Cracker Jacks two months prior, you know? And so, and then I've also seen where maybe it happened a while ago, but sometimes those foreign body, bodies will move around a little bit. And so it, it doesn't create a pneumonia necessarily, but there's that intermittent cough when it's kind of mm. bouncing around between the right and left main stems or, you know what I mean? Oh. I've seen that too. Um, and then in terms of noisy breathing, um, you I, I know in the general, as well as in the pediatric ENT clinics, we're going to see a lot of laryngomalacia that otherwise healthy baby that, um, you know, is as noisy and, um, it might start as early as two to four weeks of life to, and it, you know, gets worse between, you know, three to six months and usually resolves the course. Um, there, I think the uh, birth, the NICU history, if they were ever in the NICU breathing tube intubation, all that stuff's very import important. And then I think the big things are how are they feeding? You know, are they gaining weight? Do they look comfortable? Are there signs of reflux? What came first? Reflux or laryngomalacia? Yeah. Right, right. Chicken or the no, when, egg. <laughs> right. When I was, when I was training, I think it was everyone with laryngeal malacia got treated for reflux. Right. So, and now it's yeah. like, well, these things tend to run together, but it's not yes. necessarily the yeah. reflux causing the laryngeal malacia. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Or is there such bad laryngeal malacia that you're breathing, you know, Yeah. You're dropping your intrathoracic pressure yes. and you're sucking <laughs> stomach contents and, into and your And you're throat. right. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that we're a little bit more thoughtful about um, whether we throw Pepsid at the patient or not, or uh, how are they doing clinically. And if there really is reflux, do I want to manage it? I might actually send them to a pediatric GI. And I, I think all of those things are okay. Um, the International Pediatric Otolaryngology Working Group has like laryngomalacia guidelines and, you know, I, I think the big things to remember is feeding, sleep disorder breathing, are they like stridulous, retracting, noisy, having trouble breathing when they sleep, and, um, you know, every time they, the other one is every, if every time they get sick, you're at the ER, or are they stopping breathing, turning blue, purple, all of those things is kind of where we have to then be a little bit more aggressive. And the aggressive maybe, okay, we're going to start with a little Pepsid, 
get you referred? Are you having concerns for choking or, you know, pacing? I might do a swallow study or a feeding eval. Um, we have an amazing pediatric uh, speech pathologist, Ashley Brown, um, here in Dallas. And <laughs> for Ashley, she gets a thousand like messages from me just because I, I find pediatric dysphagia really difficult. And so I always ask her like, hey, you know, video swallow or would you just want to do a feeding eval first you know because again a video swallow is fluoroscopy it's a little yeah, radiation you're radiating so, the, which your yeah. husband an interventional radiologist would be like oh come on that's nothing <laughs> but yeah but these, these yeah. kids are little yeah. little peanuts exactly um and so yeah that those are my thoughts on normal moisture yeah yeah the uh the noisy and just for for our non otolaryngology colleagues i would just remind you in kids the larynx sits really high uh, that's one of the reasons that they can lie down and drink and you can't uh, <laughs> because the the um the uvula and it interdigitates with the epiglottis and it allows the the food to avoid or the the milk to avoid the larynx which um, can sometimes make the scope exam really hard because it's like soft palate and uvula getting in the way yeah. of seeing the larynx <laughs> exactly. yeah and yeah, yeah. their stuff is a little bit more anterior and everything's tiny <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it, can so, be, yeah, it can be hard to yeah like a laryngeal cleft you're trying to see with a oh, two millimeter flexible yeah scope. or does yeah, the yeah. cord move i mean yeah. you know um what i find that's helpful now sometimes what i'll do is um so i'll record it and then what I'll sometimes do is on the tower, I'll record it on my iPhone and mm. I'll go through it with my hand slow-mo to see, can I tell if there's mobility or not? Oh. Because sometimes there's just so much crying. Sometimes there's tension because they're, they're mad and then you can't tell like, and to me, a vocal cord weakness or paralysis can be, whether it's unilateral, bilateral, unless it's super obvious, it can be really difficult. Yeah. And something like a bilateral vocal cord paralysis is not common, but it can happen. And sometimes they'll be otherwise healthy babies. And um, to give that diagnosis, it's, that's a big deal, you know, yeah. because you may need an MRI you, for a curi, or you may, you know, if they're not feeding growing, you may end up having to consider something like a cricoid split or a trait, depending on the kid and what center yeah. and who's doing what. I mean, I don't do, I'll do pediatric tracheostomies, but I don't, I'm not one of our main airway people. So um, to me, that actually has been very helpful. And the reason we started doing that is that on our flexible scopes, there's actually an iPhone adapter. So for consults in the hospital, so instead of carrying a big case around, you can get the adapter, put it on the eyepiece of the flex, uh, learning a scope, record it. And then what's nice is you can review the scope, show your partners, and then also slow it down to really get a look. That's a nice oh, little... In our hospital, we have disposable scopes. What? So every time you, you scope someone, you throw it away. That's amazing. It's insane to me. Oh it's my insane. God. Like just the waste of resources, like rather than cleaning it. Although somebody at some point did a cost analysis and, and decided that that was the right thing to do. But yeah, we don't walk around with the case. I call <laughs> ahead of time and they bring from two different parts of the hospital. One place has the screen and one place has the yeah. scope. And they have to know what I'm talking about. And yeah. yeah. But so. the reason that I brought up the, the height of the larynx is because a lot of those kids present with stuffy nose. They're yeah. like the kid is the kids. He's congested. Well, are they taking a pacifier? Yeah. They're drinking from a bottle, or nursing? Yeah. Oh, okay. they don't have congestion. Yes. Their nose is working just fine. But it sounds like that noisy yeah. breathing sounds like congestion because the larynx sits so high that it sounds almost sounds like it's coming from the nose. Yeah. So, yeah. So those are, before yeah. before we end, I feel like we had to talk about the snoring kids real fast. Okay. Okay. Let's, I mean, I don't know. Is it boring? I feel like. <laughs> Sleep disorder breathing um, for pediatric OS, uh, for pediatric ENT or general ENT, we see those kids. And I think the, um, sometimes the question is, you know, do you get the sleep study? Do you just take the, uh, do the TNA? Do you just do the adenoids? Or, and I think in terms of where you do it, inpatient. Total TNA, intracap. Uh, you, you know, so in residency, I did intracaps. In fellowship in my practice, I've been doing totals. However, um, I think in a high risk child that potentially might bleed and in a really young child, I think intracap is way to go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What okay. about you? What about you? I did not train doing intracaps, but I do mostly intracaps now. Yeah. Um, with, do you do the cobalator with or a micro debrider? Uh, I started off doing the micro debrider and it was just a bloody mess. So yeah, I just yeah. use the cobalator. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. yeah. It's nice. It's great. And it's the yeah. recovery is, is so easy. And some of those kids where you're like, 
you know, do I do, do I just do the adenoids? Yeah, but the mm -hmm. tonsils are really big too. Yeah, but do they have OSA or is it just bad snort? Like it it makes the decision making easier because the risk is so low of yeah. of a bleed or dehydration. Right. You don't see dehydration in those kids where you do a yeah. um Okay. Uh, in, in your experience, in though, how often do you see tonsillar regrowth? Now, I think reported it's like less than two, three percent. So, um, how are you defining it? Like, is it recurrence of, of, of sleep apnea, or is it just like, yeah, it looks like they grew back a little bit? Because, no, I think that's a great question because yeah. it doesn't matter. It's just like adenoids, right? They yeah. grow back. We're shaking, yeah. but it's a low in uh, mowing the grass. <laughs> exactly, but so so, so yeah. yeah. How many times? How many revision tonsillectomies That's have right. I done? Mm -hmm. One of my own and one of someone else's, and I've been in practice for over ten years. So and so, and I, I think see, that's a I see great a lot of kids in my practice. I think that's a great point. No, I think that's a great point because I will tell you in a group where we do totals, I've probably done with totals one of my own and one of somebody else's in the last 10 years so that could be you know what i mean i think that's yeah. a good i think it's a good way to <laughs> yeah, yeah like the study on uh peritonsillar abscesses the, the the rate of needing to do an ind was like six percent for antibiotics and steroids and six percent for ind both both you know needed a, a an ind like in only six percent so it yeah. showed that the two were equivalent there's an interesting yeah. uh, parallel there um so um yeah so i i've been the only time i really won't shave if is if i'm concerned that there will be persistent sleep apnea afterwards and so if there's yeah. some other condition that's predisposing the kid to sleep apnea i'm going to want to remove more tissue so, so removing obesity. more tissue i think is the, yeah so if there's obesity or some craniofacial abnormality or something else that's making me think that it's not or if the tonsils are really small you know, the, the academy guidelines are saying, I, I think it's the academy guidelines recommendation, or maybe it was my CME uh, question that I that I now have to do, um, that even if the tonsils are small, the first line of treatment is it's adenotonsillectomy. Yeah. yeah, so you're not going to do it. So I was cap told, on two plus tonsils. Yeah, I always tell families that like tonsils are kind of like belly buttons. Do you find that to be true? I mean, so you you get the Alice, right? Oh, and you're clamping, and right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're like belly buttons. And yep. like, and I, and I do think that when kids go to sleep, the innies may fall in a little bit. There's probably a little collapse. And so that's why... You know, we might have kids with four plus tonsils in our clinic that have normal sleep studies and like kids with one to two plus that, you know, have severe OSA and granted there may be other things, I don't know, or maybe they're otherwise healthy and um, you, you know, do the TNA and every once in a while they're still tiny, but a lot of times you pull it out with the Alice and you're like, okay, this is actually a two to three plus, you know, it's just sitting yeah, yeah. in the fossa better. The tip of the iceberg. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or the ones, or the ones that are like just they're just hanging on by a thread to begin with. And you're like, well, that was easy. Just a little mm -hmm. zip and it's, and it's out. So I'll tell you my criteria for, for, and I'll see if my, my judgment is, is as good as a, a pediatric Stop. academic pediatric Stop. otolaryngologist. Please. So, um, so what, so one is, are the adenoids an issue? Right. So if they're huge adenoids, kids, a chronic mouth breather, that's going to lead to craniofacial abnormalities. Like, and if they're, yeah, they're snoring at the same time, then, and they're not responding to nasal steroids. And I almost always will try nasal steroids. Even if the adenoids are huge, I'll almost always try nasal steroids first. Um, Cause I've been very surprised. Uh, then I'll just do an intracapsular adenotonsillectomy, right? Because even if I'm not sure if it's sleep apnea, right? The, they, the, ta the adenoids have to go because the kid can get craniofacial right. abnormality. They can get adenoid facies, dental issues from being a chronic mouth breather. So that there, there's them. And then there's the kids who have loud snoring, witnessed apneic episodes, and inattention, hyperactivity, and uresis. And that's, yeah. you know, for our pediatric colleagues, that's more common than like tiredness, right? Yeah. They're going to have, they're going to be like the fidgety kid, the, the yeah. kid that might get diagnosed with ADHD. And so those kids, I'm not going to do a sleep study. I'm just going to take yeah. out the tonsils, tonsils and the adenoids. What is a sleep study? Even if it says they have no sleep apnea, what am I going to I'm not going to buy it. No, we, we do symptoms. it for symptoms yeah. for sleep disorder breathing, which is not necessarily OSA. Yeah. I think and then um, if, yeah, if I'm on the fence, like, yeah. do they have sleep apnea? Behavioral, Absolutely. behaviors on, but a lot of times if they have like loud snoring and, but they're, but no daytime sequelae. Yeah. Right. I will often observe those kids unless I've got some suspicion that they might have more severe and then I'll order the sleep study. But a lot of times I don't even get a sleep study in them. Why? Because they're fine. They're fine yeah. during the day. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, no, for sure. I um, So in terms of uh, when I will always get a sleep study is uh, definitely when, uh, under the age of two. And I actually will sometimes under the age of three as well. Although um, the, with the most updated, it's under two for sure, because those kids have a harder time in terms of post-op O2 requirements and things like that. Now, um, I, the kids that are high risk in terms of for severe OSA, they probably have it, but how bad is it and where are we starting with? Uh, those kids, I'll, I'll get one in. So my kids with Down syndrome and granted they, the AP, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends one by the time of the age of four. Um, uh, my obese kids, and it depends because um, I usually say, let's go ahead and start. It depends on the, in terms of, you know, let's get one, but um, and especially if they're morbidly obese. However, the families really kind of listen. Um, we just, you know, don't want to have to do the overnight. It's an extra cost. Um, then maybe we'll just go ahead and do it. And I usually keep all of anybody uh, that's super obese, regardless of the sleep study, uh, admitted anyways overnight. Um, and then any kid with sickle cell, um, where their sleep disorder breathing that we're thinking of taking a, uh, taking out tonsils should get a sleep study before those kids are at high risk for hypoxemia, higher risk of stroke, things like that. Um, my kids with craniofacial abnormalities, mid face hypoplasia, um, you know, super retrognathic, other, you know, other, you know, you know, poor tone, you know, uh, neuromuscular, you know, there's other reasons. I may also get one as well. Um, and so you're talking are... about kids that have like snoring and witnessed apneic episodes, or you're just saying all of your kids that fall into these high risk categories for I would having say OSI? Se uh, I would say 90% of my kids that fall into those categories that are symptomatic will get a sleep study before I take out tonsils and adenoids. Um, okay. Yeah, except so if they're I might not be... snoring, then you won't get a sleep study. Uh, well, except for the, the kids with Down syndrome. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thank you for clarifying that. Um, and then I agree with you. Anytime the history doesn't fit the picture, and that's going to be the, the, the three to four year old otherwise healthy kid, not obese, you know, know their medical problems went to the dentist, the dentist noticed that the tonsils were three plus, you know, there's some mouth breathing, um, there's some hyperactivity and maybe a light snore when they're sick. What do you, what, what do I want to do with that? You know, and that I, it may be that we need to sit down and talk a little bit more in the clinic about, you know, behavior things like that. But even that can be sometimes hard. And sometimes I'll go ahead and get a sleep study um, on those kids just to kind of get some concrete data. So what happens when you get a sleep study on any of those kids, but, and again, I apologize to the general physician audience here. We're getting into the weeds and pediatric sleep studies and their apnea hypopnea index is five, right? Yeah. So they have borderline moderate sleep apnea. Yeah. What's the significance of that, right? Like if you have a kid who's so, like, is there behavior? Is that kid who's a little hyperactive? Are you going to take them to the operating room and their behavior is going to significantly change? Like I, I just, I'm not sure what yeah. to do. Sometimes. No, I, and I think that that's a great point, especially in our adolescents. You know, if you have a 16 year old <laughs> getting a sleep study at a pediatric center, their age yeah. is 10, they're going to be severe OSA. But if you yeah. on adult guidelines, that's mild. And what are you going to do? You know, especially if their tonsils are one plus, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, but no, I, do I, think I say it, the same thing. I, yeah. I interpret those. I'm like, you look at you. <laughs> You're like 6'3", yeah. 220. You're, you're bigger than me. You've like, gone through you're, puberty. Yeah, you're on the adult scale. I'm not comparing you to this like 45-pound yeah. five-year-old. Yeah. But the AHI of five an hour in a three to five-year-old, I do think is significant because really? that's every 12 minutes or so. If there's something going on, there's some sort of interruption. Um, and if the family notices symptoms at home, you know, I think that that is very reasonable to go ahead and take them out. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, a, a lot of, I, I would say maybe 10 to 15% of the referrals are actually coming from our pediatric dentist. Um, they're, uh, I feel like the uh, dentists are, do, are doing a lot more in terms of sleep screening because of sedation in their clinics and things like that. Um, and so I, I think that's, I think that's great, right? That, that, that screen is there. Um, but then it also can be sort of, uh, what do I do with this? <laughs> what do I want to do with this? You know, so. Although I, my, um. My dentist did a head neck exam without knowing what I did and told me that my hyoid was 
told me that my was feel, palpating my hyoid and told me that I should get my thyroid evaluated. Oh gosh. Yeah. But no, but we do yeah. appreciate those, <laughs> those referrals from our from our pediatric colleagues whenever yeah. whenever whenever there's a concern, whenever there's a concern. Yeah. So please please keep sending those patients. But, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, we've been we've been talking for a long time. We could talk for for I much longer. Going. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I was I was hoping there's we could lot. get one tip on uh, on how to get wax out of the ears of small oh, woodly children, but no, but we're going to so have hard. to save that in case there's a, in case there's a next time. So, that uh, we've already been at this for almost an hour. So yeah. Dr. Gopi Shah of back table <laughs> ENT podcast. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Brad. It's been a pleasure. Um, I love talking shop with you. So thank you so much for having me. <laughs> that was Dr. Bradley block at the physician's guide to doctoring. He can be found at physician's guide to doctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.